I'm Austin's Animals, collecting all things Foy. And I thought what better way than to wing in the spooky season than talking about some lost media. Minova Mink. What an absolute foy icon. She's a sex symbol and one of the most popular characters from the television show The Animaniacs. Despite having only 30 minutes of screen time across over 100 episodes, parents complained at the audacity of a curvy femme mink and her snarky, mean, and somewhat sexual humor aimed at a preteen audience. Minerva's only two animated shorts are tamed by today's standards, but you have to remember that Animaniacs was pre-Family Guy, pre-South Park, so Minerva Mink was pulled from the Animaniacs cast aside from a few cameos. Being such an obscure character, there can't be anything Minerva Mink to collect, so ancient history, right? Enter the world of spooky lost media because Minerva Mink might have actually had a chance to land on your foy shelf. I was browsing eBay like I do, looking up obscure animation characters. I typed in Minerva Mink on a whim. It was mostly cells from the actual show, but then I saw this. Unproduced Minerva Mink plush? Is this real? I salivated at the thought of Minerva Mink having unproduced March. After all, the original Animaniacs was a huge cash cow, and at the zenith of the Warner Brothers studio store, what if Minerva Mink had planned to be right there with Pinky and the Brain and the Warner Brothers on that plush self? So let's look at this plush that could have been. There's no doubting this is Minerva Mink, clad in skin-tight red dress, floaty eyes, and busty features. Even her long, beautiful hair hits the floor but something about this plush is a little off. She's very stylized. I mean, she looks like she got flattened by a cartoon anvil. She's little. Her eyes also look pretty modern in design. She kind of looks like a character from Sabrina Online, if you're familiar with the walk of Eric Swartz. I have a theory on why this plush looks this way. I think this toy was going to be produced for the Animaniacs reboot on HBO Max, not an original plush from the 1990s cartoon. The first dead ringer is the condition itself. The plus is immaculate. The second is design. Minerva Mink actually showed up in the rebooted cartoon in the episode Good Warner Hunting with an updated design. Notice her chibi look, her more bulbous head and tiny body. Her hair and dress also have the saturation cranked up. In the original show, the dress was more pink than straight Jessica Rabbit Red. Finally, there's the eyes. All the original Animaniacs plush from the 90s had plastic eyes. The new ones from Kid Robot and Warner Brothers Studio Store, the online store, not the physical Warner store, have stitched eyes. I think this plush fits those online Studio Store plush. I could see it stocked on their website or maybe as part of the Warner Backstage Tour. Another thing that stuck out to me was those stubby hands and bean feet. This plush looks like it was made by Budsies a company that makes custom plush. This is a very literal interpretation of the blue promo art for HBO Max. It's like someone just looked at this promo art alone and knew nothing else about Minerva Mink and made this plush. So does that make it unofficial? Even if that's the case, I still think this is an official toy. See, a lot of companies actually use Bud Budsy's plush to test a character in plush form They'll order four to five of these Budsies and use them as a base for mass-produced plush. For example, this gypsy fox I own is a Budsies plush made by my good friend Albert as a conceptual prototype for a mass-produced doll. This character had a lot of special features, and he wanted to see how that could translate to toy form. By the way, check out Kooky Trails. Minerva Mink is no pinky or brain, she has a lot of distinct curvature, and the toy designer might have commissioned a Budsy or two to use as a base. It's a little sneaky move, but I get it. Our final piece of evidence is the seller's description, which reads, This plush of Minerva Mink seems to be a prototype sample of a previously unreleased or perhaps future plush. No company has ever produced any plushes of her, making this plush incredibly rare. 
It was obtained from a factory worker selling off old factory assets and stock. She stands roughly 10 inches tall and is very soft. She is very light rail from storage. No tags on the plush. So this plush might actually be released soon. I doubt it, but it is the 15th anniversary of the Animaniacs next year, and there's new merch coming, like the first ever figure of Dr. Scratch and Sniff, so who knows? Our next Minerva Mink spooky lost media is a comic book. No big deal, right? Minerva Mink had plenty of appearances in the Animaniacs comics. She was actually a major player, mainly because all the episodes that were planned for her were pulled off of TV, and the scripts were used for these comics. Well, what if I told you there was a Minerva Mink spin-off comic? And it was actually produced, but there's little to no documentation of it on the internet. This was a rumor I heard on Full Affinity, and the comic series Furlough contained an unproduced Minerva Mink spin-off comic. Furlough was a furry comic anthology that ran for over 15 years. Every issue had short stories, most of which were pitch pilots for full comic releases. A lot of Animaniacs artists also worked on Folo. This theory seemed a little plausible, so I decided to dig a little deeper by buying an entire long box of Folo comics. The first few years of Folo were strictly military and sci-fi stories, a remnant of the 1980s furry scene. Not until the later issues did the short stories switch over to tune and fantasy, so that was the best place to start looking. What I did find was an amazing anthology of original furry stories. Fullo has some serious hidden gems and great comics, it deserves its own documentary video. A lot of Animaniacs alumni worked on Fullo. Kyle A. Carosa was an artist that drew Claire's stupid life. You can see the Animaniacs inspiration here. Also, he would later use Fullo to promote his cartoon Moo Beard the Pirate, which got picked up by Nickelodeon and he later went to Cartoon Network to create Mighty Magiswords. Not related, but I just thought that was pretty interesting. Another Animaniacs artist was Rusty Hollow, who created Ace and Queenie, a secret spy romance that would become one of Furlough's flagship running stories. I really enjoyed discovering all these vintage, independent furry stories. Even if there was no Minerva Mink Lost comic, at least I got to discover all this awesome artwork. But then, I read issue 110. Look at that innocent army bunny. She doesn't even know. I was reading this comic. I flipped the next page and whoa, there she is. No doubt about it, Minerva Mink weaseling her way into Folo. This comic is called Tricks on One's Mind. And it's a raunchy comedy about a telekinetic mink living in an idealized turn of the century. Think Bewitched meets Downton Abbey with all of the innuendo of the original Minerva Mink cartoons. In this comic, she's not referred to as Minerva Mink, but rather Margaret Mink, and that's Mink with a C, not a K. Margaret Mink comes from the Van Mink family, and the females in this family have telekinetic powers. So she just recently engaged the love of her life, Mike, and the two decide to throw a family reunion so every Van Mink can meet the newlyweds. Everyone seems to be having a good time, except for Minerva, I mean Margaret's mother, who hates family reunions because she thinks they're boring. So in order to spice things up, she decides to use her telekinesis, yes, her mother's telekinetic just like her, to expose the women at the party and strip them down to their lingerie, hey, hey now. So the nude women thinks it's the men who's doing this because you know, sexism. Until Margaret figures out that it's her pervy mother and sentences her to babysitting, the comic ends with Mike telling Margaret that she had better not be like her mother with the telekinetic powers, and to only use them for useful and good purposes. Our final shot has Margaret in bed, turning the light off, before using her telekinetic powers to do something sensual to Mike. It's a fun, sexy, and cheeky comic that feels straight out of the world of Minerva Mink. The turn of the century aesthetic in particular is very Animaniacs-like. They were always doing period pieces. So this is an official Animaniacs spin-off, right? Kind of? Well, the story itself was written by John Sedwick, a furry writer who specializes in turn of the century furry Americana. He claims on his fur affinity that this is an original creation, but look at it, it's not fooling anyone. That's because the comic was drawn by Leo Botic, 
a veteran Animaniacs artist who worked extensively on the Animaniacs comic. Remember, Minerva Mink was heavily featured in the comic, so he likely knew the character better than the showrunners themselves. I'm sure he saw this original script about a mink using telekinesis in pervy ways in a bewitched-like parody and thought, hey, that kind of sounds like a Minerva Mink cartoon, and thus drew two Minerva Mink-like cartoons. Two? Did I say two? Yes, because there's a sequel in full low number 117. This is the last one from what I found, but if you know any more of these Minerva Mink comics, please let me know. I'm missing a couple issues of full low, so you never know. The story is called Red Dew, Blue, and Black Mink, and follows Mike and Margaret again. This time we find out that Margaret's dad runs a sports supply business and wants Mike to test out the new equipment. Mike instantly agrees, who wouldn't agree with this woman, but finds himself soon in a goofy cartoon-like predicament. This is football equipment, and he isn't built like the jocks, so this guy gets pummeled, all to the father Van Mink's amusement, as it shows how resistant the sports gear is. However, Margaret decides to check in on the boys and is mortified to find her husband being used as a punching bag. She tries to put a stop to it, but Mike insists on letting the demonstration finish. After all, he wants the Van Minks to get a deal with the sports company for their gear. He uses his wits to outsmart the jocks and knock them dead. Seeing all the jocks knocked out with the gear convinces the sports team to sign a contract with the Van Mink Taylor Company. Mike is victorious, though heavily bruised from all the action on the field. Not to worry though, Margaret says she has just the thing to keep his mind off all the pain. And that's our second Minerva, I mean Margaret, Mink comic. This one also fits the world of Animaniacs perfectly. Watching the jocks try to pummelless little Mink Man reminds me of the classic Goofy cartoons of the Golden Age, but with a little modern twist. These two stories buried in full low is sadly all we have of the nearly lost Minkvoss. We were given a pretty wonderful world that was based or clearly heavily inspired by the Minerva Mink shorts. Who knew one cult character could produce a world of funny and witty Mink characters? I love how these comics can be pretty crude, violent, and sexual, yet still super endearing. Margaret and Mike clearly love each other and aren't afraid to be super affectionate. Both comics feature a lot of slapstick and physical humor, yet they both end with Mike and Margaret cuddling in bed intimately. Dare I say these comics are better than the Minerva Mink shorts? They keep all the innuendo and adult jokes, but they certainly add a lot of humanity and warmth. And the world building helps. Writer John Segwick created a charming, idealized turn of the century East Coast America that has its own identity, yet still fits right in with the Animaniacs mini period pieces. Full Low isn't technically lost media, you can buy them on eBay for cheap, but I have never heard of these comics, and I've browsed many a site related to the Animaniacs and Minerva Mink, and I'm surprised these aren't more well known, even as a cult thing. Like hey, remember when Minerva Mink had her own adult comic and a furry comic? That was nice. There is a website listed on the first panel, which supposedly led to Leo Botic's portfolio. I thought this would be a great way to see any more of this Mink comic, but the website is long gone and the Wayback Machine has only archived a simple splash page, which I presume was Botic's logo. Now Botic does have an art station account, and from there you can view nearly all of his work on the Animaniacs in crystal clear high resolution, so give that a, give that a look. Let's give Leo Botic, John Sedwick, and Eric Costello their due, and shine light on this underrated Minerva Mink spinoff that was featured in Furlough. For your viewing pleasure, the rest of this video will feature scans of this comic in its entirety, so we can safely assume this gem is no longer lost media.
Thank you.